All right, here we are on the 20th of May, uh, stepping into week three of the 2024 Soil Nutrition Conference, the theme of uh, the state of nutrient density. Got a couple, I think, I can't speak to my personal presentation, but I really appreciated uh, Ken's last week and very happy to be having Mark Fredericks on today. Um, <clears throat> known him for a few years now. Uh, he's a, a brilliant man from the Netherlands. Um, we're talking about game theory today is the best word I've got for it. I'm not sure if that means as much to other people as it means to me. My father was a, a board game designer and my brother and father talk about game theory. And so I <clears throat> never really understood it until I'm talking to Mark and uh, you know the real the, the deep the deep uh, implications of it as far as how we can envision structuring our society and culture well. So um, as is the pattern, we're going to have him speak for the next hour, and then we'll have panelists engaging. We've got a we'll have at least four other people on the panel here today. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll always uh, put your your questions that you'd like the panel uh, or Mark to answer in the Q and A section, and your communications with each other in the chat section. I'll uh, I'll just let it, let it let it go from there, Mark. Welcome very much. Thank you, Dan, um, offering me this opportunity to um, tell you and the others a bit about me, my journey, and um, how we met. And um, I was absolutely inspired um, also about meeting you during, uh, well, several visits in the Netherlands and um, um, exploring the world of uh, nutrient density and the true value of food. And um, yeah, so I'm really privileged to be here and also privileged to present to all of you um, my ideas, journeys and perspective. And um, I hope and expect that uh, we can make some uh, really important connections um the coming period to um, make the transition of our food system uh whole and and restore um the herd of humans again and uh by empowering farmers and their uh, soils um i have a presentation that i would like to share with you so i'm opening it right now here it is and first I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. This picture is uh, from me. There's a QR code on the right side that you can scan to connect uh, with me through LinkedIn. So feel free to connect. Uh, looking forward to connections. Uh, my name is Mark Fredericks. Um, I have a background in publishing, marketing and communication. And um, I've been making my own meals from the age of 16 and became friends with uh, local farmers. Uh, well, now 54 years old. So it's uh, it's a, almost a lifetime of uh, having a relationship with uh, local farmers and good food. And um, during my uh, encounter with local farmers, I saw there was a lot of... Uh, things wrong in how we organize our food system and the value that farmers create and, and the reward that they get and the control of their own destiny that they uh, that they have. Um, coming from a, a father that was a union leader in the Netherlands, my grandparents all were in the Dutch resistance during the Second World War. So um, seeing all these um, you know, troubles around the farmer making ends meet made me mad in the first place but then uh, being mad just costs you a lot of energy it doesn't bring a lot of good um i saw that that there is so much value there that isn't being activated that after being mad i started to wonder how this could happen and then i uh, started doing uh, what i've been doing the last 18 years challenging the food system empowering farmers and empowering local communities um both ends of the food chain are needed to fix the problem. So this is a short observation of where the food system is right now. On the left upside is the current system, winner takes all. Um, consumers, we all see rising food costs, lack of trust in quality trademarks, 
There is no future perspective for farmers. Um, in the Netherlands, we have a sharp decline of uh, farmer population, about 5 to 10% on a yearly basis stop. And 80% of loss in nutritional value um, since 1950 is measured. And we throw away 30 to 40% of our food. So there's something seriously wrong in our food chain where only the winner takes all and both ends of the food chain, well, don't have any control what is happening. So I envision a, a future food system where the, the future of a farmer is part of the food chain and takes care of him. Um, biodiversity is key and affordable, healthy food for all is available. And, and I always say it's the diversity that creates the flavor. So we need a diverse population of farmers and we need a diverse population of uh, society to regenerate ourselves. So that's a, that's a key aspect. And um, this is what I've been doing. I've been building short food supply chains in the Netherlands for more than 18 years, um, developed six different archetypes of short food supply chains, um, business to business, business to consumer, pick up points, box key models. We did it all. And in the end, um, it's a business model that is, uh, well, pretty tough um, to do. Building a local food system on a regional scale, it's challenging. And during my journey as a professional, having a background in publishing, I developed skills in gamification, in how we can apply different set of rules on how we, as a herd of humans, in a regional context can counter the enormous pressure that we have of this global system that we created that, that well, in the end, hijacks all the value. And um, I think if we look at Mother Nature, how she organizes herself, apply digital infrastructure, and we can, for humanity, develop a learning ecosystem for human ecosystems. And that is what I believe. Short food supply chains and other models that are being developed all over the world. This visual that you see here is just a small uh, selection of networks challenging the food system, regenerative agriculture networks, ecosystem restoration communities, short food supply chains, community supported agriculture, bio-based solutions, nutrient density, farmer uh, collectives, building data, many, many, many more. All over the world, communities rise up because our government isn't fit for purpose in taking the actions needed and our market isn't fit for purpose because they only serve a couple of, well, rich people, investment funds, and there's no human connection there. That's the reason why they can do what they do. And the real value of food is not being rewarded, appreciated, and uh, paid for. Um, so this is an interesting visual, seeing the restoration community, short food supply chains, city populations moving towards fixing the system themselves. It's, it's, it's big. And what I saw that all these initiatives, and, and if I reflect to myself, we, we started the short food supply chain 18 years ago. We had 20 farmers. We had a, an, an online web shop, really basic one. We had a small truck and we had the first customers. We didn't know anything about food safety. We didn't know anything about logistics. We just wanted to pay the farmer a good price. And then um, now after 18 years, we, we created a platform that connects different farmer collectives in the context of their region and, and share data. And still it's difficult because we need to compete in a marketplace where only the efficiency is being paid for and uh, a farmer being anonymous gives them the authority to do whatever they want and and that's that's <laughs> that's a problem so what i did as a publisher i created diff several games and there are two game models practically that we can follow one is formed like a pyramid you start small and in the end you're on top of the mountain and you dominate everybody and if, if people didn't listen you just would have well killed them um really dominant so to grow you need to eat your competitors 
and scale, 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 scale and become more efficient. And I don't believe that that game model is the thing that we as change makers are following. We want to become more inclusive. We want to become more diverse instead of focusing on on one business model and hopefully uh, cut out our competitors and, and others. So I would like to follow another game approach. That's a game where you start small and do whatever you want in your own vision. And in the end, top of the mountain, you're not on top of the mountain, you're in a level playing field where you become more inclusive and people take care of you instead of kill you. So this is the game transition model we developed and it's based on a model of a multiplayer online game. And it starts at level one. I see it as a tutorial level, tutorial level. I'm alone, Mark, in this case, I'm starting a short food supply chain, local to local. In the middle, you see uh, in the black dot, you see one guy sitting there building his own network and building his company uh, based on his vision. And, and I, I'm working my socks off. Then the second level, after 10 years or so, I'm able to have a network of diverse organizations, farmers, young talents, municipalities, um, customers, uh, other change makers, maybe knowledge institutions, they are connected with me. And in the middle, I'm still the guy doing it and challenging it. And, and well, in my case, I was uh, carrying around about 800 different products from, in this case, 50 different farmers with really complex logistics and, and well, customers were willing to pay a little bit more for my product, but not that much that I could really invest in, in a new food system, regenerate soils and, and really create a marketplace because I didn't have the margin for marketing. So what I needed to do in the, in the marketplace where we dominant, where we need to either competitors to scale, I would have got an investor in and, and get money and grow, 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 grow. I didn't take that course. And I looked at, okay, every time as an entrepreneur with, with a really, um, uh, with my business model not really fit for the next challenge, every time I wanted to take the next step uh, and change something, I, I, I ended up in a valley of death, they call it in business. So no margin to invest in marketing, no margin to optimize my technology, no margin to, to scale up my, my business. So... Then after I looked around and, and, and identified hundreds of these people all over the Netherlands doing the same thing, I said, wait, wait a second, I'm playing the different game. I need to find another game. So what I did is I looked at the other gamification model where in the end you see that when I look around and see all people doing the same things, I need to play a different game. So to grow, I need to collaborate instead of compete. So... Me in the Netherlands, in Utrecht, I have some logistics, I had a food festival, I had some farmers, but to challenge um, the things that I, that, I, that I have on my way to grow, I needed to collaborate with, for instance, a guy from Amsterdam or a guy from Berlin. So instead of doing it myself, I needed to enter a space where I could co-create. Call it a dungeon, I call it a challenge room, where we bring together our inventory, our data sets, our logistics, our technology that we developed, our expertise, co-create a solution. After the solution is being developed, we can put it in our collective inventory and then be our own selves in Utrecht or Amsterdam or Berlin or hey, even in Massachusetts. Um, and this, this is what I learned and experimented for a lot of years. And I see that it's working. And on the fourth level, you see that... Um, looking down from more like a holistic point of view on every step, individual level, regional collective level, and co-create between regions, that you're designing the game rules for how our, our, our economy, but also how our um, governance is being modeled. And we have been implementing this model in the Netherlands the last 15 years with uh, success, especially the last five years, started before Corona and now scaling up. Um, looking at, we have been doing from local to local and AMT. Uh, AMT is my consulting company that 
develops gamification models, uh, regional food strategies and technology, and local to local that sells local products. How do I make money? And based on this gain model, you have the same levels in the business model that we developed. So at level one, individual uh, organization, and level two, we activate short food supply chain networks and we sell, in this case, local uh, products. And we have a fee in the sales or a margin in uh, uh, the market. If you look at level two, the region and the interregional level, in this level with other regions, governments, and uh, uh, networks, we create services. So we have software as a service. We have different uh, uh, game models that we can share. We have resources that we can share. We can share spaces. So this is an additional business model that we collectively between regions can explore and develop. And on the fourth level, we apply for grants for developing blockchain and bridge the uh, make the bridge between entrepreneurs and universities, but also uh, address the front runners, the leaders in the process uh, doing so. There's one important thing that I didn't address in the previous slide. And that's it, that is the, the clash of egos. And after 18 years working on different startups um, that, that are basically challenging the system and not having the systemic solution to do so, there is a, in the bridge between level two, having your regional network around you and taking the step into this co-creative place of level three, there's always um, something as, okay, I, I built this myself, this is my dream. And to let go of part of your dream, going from level two, your community, entering an open space to co-create, that's a difficult phase. And what you see, if you don't offer the leaders that are started uh, this movement, the business or this initiative, you don't offer them perspective to grow and scale themselves on a personal level, they, well, it's pretty hard to, to collaborate with them if you don't offer them the perspective. So in this model, in the end, every individual that is active on level one can grow or develop himself to level four. In, every direction so it's an open space well um having this theoretical framework of the multiplayer online game where you collaborate instead of compete we said well okay this is a theoretical thing we understand that is uh, there's something really interesting here um we looked at okay can we develop a roadmap where we step by step go from level one individual to level two, co-creation, to level three, convert into this open space of co-creation and then speed up and putting it in the, in the market and create value together. Um, we started just before Corona applying this roadmap. And the roadmap, also four phases, um, was implemented in the metropole region of Amsterdam. And what we did, is the following. The first step that we took, um, and during this process, I also met Dan with the nutrient density uh, movement, is that we the first thing that we did was, okay, there are so many initiatives, uh, short food supply chains or CSAs, in this case, I focused on the short food supply chain networks that are active and they wanted to challenge or to deliver their local goods to the city of Amsterdam, that... Uh, but there none, none of them was on a professional level to really scale and speed up. So we were all in, in, in well, having difficulty um, getting our local products and our stories in the city of Amsterdam in the marketplace. So what we did at the first stage is we reached out to all these short food supply chains that uh, initiatives around Amsterdam, but that were already active. And we had a discussion with them. Okay, where are you now? A logistical point of view where are you now from a marketing perspective what do you need and what can you offer the local market and we saw that that these short food supply chain initiatives all had a different level of maturity some of them were pretty advanced with logistics other others were just at the starting phase for instance we had a group of sheep herders on the isle of tessel 
that I wanted to to sell their local uh, uh, meat to the local market instead of exporting it to France and getting, uh, well, uh, not a good price for their product. Um, so the first thing what we did is we we met with them and we optimized their first mile hub, just focusing on logistics, getting the assortment in place and make sure that their collaboration between them was on a standard that we could work on them. And we asked them, what do you need? And we saw this is in the, in the green box, they wanted sales, they sell the products. They were looking for certain expertise and not always expertise on um, selling products, but they also had questions about food safety. They had questions about marketing, storytelling, social media, data, etc. And so we're looking for specific expertise. They wanted logistical support. They were looking for workers and especially in the Netherlands and well, during Corona, it was a big issue. We, we, have all uh, uh, kinds of workers from Poland and other parts of the world to do the hard work. And uh, step by step, less of them came to the Netherlands. So there was a problem there. The, the average age in the Netherlands at this moment is 47 years old. So not a lot of young people. And the people that are young are not willing to do the hard labor on the farm. Um, and they needed funding because the, the bank was not open for business for transforming our local farmers to a local market or to regenerative or, or organic farming. So there, there was an issue. And this is only the top five. There were 30 different uh, uh, parts that we were looking for. And the second question we asked them is, okay, and, and what could you offer your local community? Well, the first response was, hey, we have food, so let's do that. And a lot of them said, well, yeah, they, are, they want uh, biodiversity, so we can work on that. Um, we can store water. Eh? In the summertime, it becomes really dry here. And in the wintertime, probably we have too much water. And hey, we're in the Netherlands. So if you're in Amsterdam, an average level of four meters of water is on top of your head as soon as the dikes break. So there's a thing there. Um, they can sequester carbon. They can create a lot of things. And they have data, unique information that we need to understand what steps we could take. So it was an interesting thing. This took about six months. And it only took six months because I already had a lot of these relationships with these pharma collectives from my own short food supply chain, company local to local. Um, the second step that we took was still before Corona kicked in, was that we said, well, okay, if we have all the logistic hubs uh, at the same level, we understand what we need and what we're looking for. Let's get our logistics in place and have an IT platform where we can share assortments uh, share products. So in the end, we, we ended up with 3,000 different products in one platform from uh, dairy farmers, uh, organic farmers, even some local fishermen put in their products in the web shop. And we organized the first mile hubs. And what we did is we fixed the city hubs around the city of Amsterdam and collectively made a contract with a delivery service that did electric uh, transport into the city because, well, it becomes mandatory step by step the coming few uh, years. So we did it already. And then it was all set. Corona hit. And um, this, was, this was really big. So we were all there, 350 farmers, seven different organizations, that all these in investments and poof, the market was gone. And what we did, um, we showed the market. The first time in the Netherlands, supermarkets were empty of food. So it show the vulnerability of our globalized food system, even in a country that is the second exporter in food in the world. So, hey, <laughs> nobody understood what was happening. But within a week, us as a collective of short food supply chains with our logistical partners started a rescue uh, mission on having fresh vegetables and fruits and meat and bread and eggs for communities in the city that were not able to buy food because they didn't get money, were out of work, or didn't uh, were afraid to get out of, the, out of their house, we we, we delivered 70,000 boxes to people in need within a week. So we were really adaptive and showed the force of when farmers and local communities connect what we can do. So that was epic. We we, we got into the news, we got in the, in, in, in the newspapers, and... What it did, it's the second step of the process, it, it woke up the people in the city. So with this action and all the publicity that we had, 
Um, the municipality of Amsterdam, universities, student communities, cultural uh, organizations, venues, transition specialists, neighborhood initiatives, they all woke up and said, hey, this is interesting. And this was between the first lockdown and the second, second lockdown. And we can discuss lockdowns and whatever. But the interesting thing is this small window of opening was really a moment where we made solid connections. We struggled with the farmers fixing this. We opened up the eyes of the city of Amsterdam and everybody there. And we had the time to really have a deep dive with them and say, hey, you see our value now and what are your needs? And these networks also in the green box uh, in the middle, they said, well, we want to have healthy food. Um, a difficult question because in the definition, uh, legally, there is no definition of healthy food. We all know what it is, but hey, <laughs> we have a government that is not putting the check boxes in the right place now. They wanted to have a green and beautiful landscape. They wanted clean water and air. They wanted to have a positive impact with their consumption. And for a lot of young, talented people from the universities and schools, they said, I want to have a meaningful job. I want to be part of it. That is something that is valuable. And these farmers give it to me. And then the question was, okay, you as a city and a network of change makers, what can you offer uh, the farmers? Well, they said, we can buy the product. We can have give them expertise. We can help them with logistics. Hey, shit, we can do the work as well. And, and, and we have money. We can help them with funding. So if the bank says no, we say yes. Interesting perspective. So first we made an analysis of the farmers. We organized themselves to get at the same level of, okay, maturity to start uh, uh, doing the logistics. And we didn't add something new. We just combined what the other collective already had and onboarded the others in it. So that's what's really basic, but they kept their own identity. And after doing this in the city as well, we did another exercise. And that was between the second and the third lockdown, because the, the second lockdown was ready or there. We started delivering food. We just did what we did and, and, and had a bigger engagement with, with the community, a, a more robust engagement. And we got some subsidies from the city of Amsterdam to, to take some next steps is that what we did is between the second and third lockdown, we had in-depth sessions with the farmers and our local communities. And we just looked at, okay, the needs and offers of the farmers and the needs and offers of our local communities and networks, how do they match? And, and we came to the conclusion that, that, that it, it, it's, it's all there. So what we did is we had some um, campaigns, we, we, we salvaged um, like, 50 cases of broccoli and then these these like cubic boxes, um, thousands of kilos of of, of beets, um, apples, and, and we 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 just engaged with the community and created new new products with with uh, uh, the products that were left over and were not being sold by by supermarkets or with with restaurants. And after doing this matchmaking with a couple of in-depth sessions is we came to the conclusion, and this was epic, that it's already all here. So we already have everything. If we collaborate on a regional scale and we look at the, the needs and offers of farmers and our local community, we are able to transform our entire region. And we have some really, really beautiful examples of that. So engaging with the city of Amsterdam during Corona, um, they, they became aware that, that the food banks that we have also didn't deliver what was needed. So they're not fit for purpose. The farmers did it. So why, as a city, do you give people in need the leftovers of the supermarket? That is not really a solution. And call it a solution. If you can, with the same investment, develop community gardens and farms again and give the people in need the best food instead of the leftovers of the supermarket and really have a systemic solution. This was only one of the examples that we designed and saw where, where, where we were able to create without having a lot of funding, just connect the dots, go to a farmer that is willing to stop because five to 10% of our local farmers in the Netherlands, they stop because there is no 
people that want to take or a son or a daughter that wants to take over the, the, the business or just run out of business because of the market isn't fit for it, their, their future. So there is people's farmers stopping. There is money in the city. There are farmers that are really willing to transform. Hey, match made in heaven. But to do this on a larger scale, we need to look at, okay, how do we, as a community within the city and farmers, how do we find the money to invest? How can we blend, blend financial instruments, subsidies, local sales, getting uh, 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 in rich individuals the opportunity to, to, in, to invest in commons and in these new farm uh, uh, models? And how do we organize ourselves? Because this, the, the government isn't doing it. So we need to figure out how can we, as a community, transform? And during this process, we let a lot of knowledgeable people that are active in transformational governance models, in blended finance, and technology. So we came to the conclusion, if we want to change the system, the solution needs to be systemic. Otherwise, it won't happen. Well, Corona ended. And during this process, especially the third lockdown, we had some time to really stand still and look at the design, the process that we followed in the Metropolitan Union of Amsterdam, this roadmap that we designed before, but we reverse engineered the entire process, engaging with farmers, engaging with local communities, matchmaking and transform these business models. Um, the University of Utrecht and the University of Amsterdam helped us with the reverse engineering of the process. And now we have a roadmap, a playbook on how you as a region can collaborate with your local uh, market. We have the tech platform to have a shared facility for transactions. We have six different archetypes of short food supply chain models that are facilitated by the technology. And we have so many playbooks and also connections with the city of Amsterdam, cultural organizations, farmer organizations that we can peer to peer connect to other regions. And during this entire journey that we're talking about five years of, of, of having like the war in Ukraine on our path, three lockdowns, and well, it was it was really a hard, hard struggle, but the, 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 the really valuable thing that was there if you fight together for something that is valuable and is needed, you get connections between farmers and, and this region that are solid, that are not only about price, they're about value and about connection, and there's trust. So trust is key. Um, we have the privilege having the gain transition model as a further uh, uh, like a template for further development in two European development programs. It's called EO for Advice and Food Click. Both uh, focus on the transition of our food system and enables us to create um, processes and structures to co-create with other regions. So it's from the European Commission. It's, it's a project that runs for five years. Then we created the Data Valley Center Agri-Food where we focus on technology and how can we, from a commons perspective, share data? And with the partnership and the long-term commitment of the city of Amsterdam, um, I think we have a good template to share all our lessons learned with other regions and other people and enable farmers to connect with citizens and local communities and just fix it together. We don't need governments. Yes, we need them, but not in the lead and we can create our own marketplace. So that is basically what we did. Okay. Now, where does it all come together? On the left side, you see the level model, level one, local, level two, regional, collaboration, level three, co-creation, and level four, okay, then it's happening. Um, next to it, you have the steps of the roadmap, also four steps. Next to that, you have the steps that we took with the networks and step-by-step and -step growing towards this, this new model. And we now at the phase where we where we can we can execute, we can speed up. And one of the most valuable um, lessons I learned is that 
I, I have a marketing and sales background and I was a publisher. So I use a lot of these names at level one, level two, inspiration, activation, convert, execute, all these marketing terms that like a lot of words. Um, I, I visited, and that is 2021, a group of quantum agriculture experts. And this is where the connection with Dan was made by Rolf Havinga, a friend of mine in the Netherlands working on regenerative agriculture. Um, they asked me to present my game model to a group of quantum agriculture uh, experts. A lot of old people with a lot of knowledge. And I was sitting there with 50 or more uh, people that help farmers transform to regenerative or, or organic. And... Um, I was in the middle of, of this. We had a four hour uh, meetup with them at a farm in, in Flevoland in the Netherlands. And there was a guy, he presented uh, pendling. And there was a guy that presented chromas as a way of measuring the vitality of food. And at first, I, I saw Frank Silvis talking about bovis values handling and the first reaction of me was well <laughs> this is funny um and actually I, I thought by myself okay what is this guy smoke um give me some but after five minutes when he started i i was completely blown away about what what he and the others were were showing me and it gave me a a whole new perspective on my gamification approach and the things that I did, I, I saw that, okay, wait, wait. And that's the right side of the, of the picture, the tree. Basically what I was doing, I was trying to mimic how mother nature uh, orchestrates itself. And I just gamified it. So it's more like a functional design that I made of, based on how mother nature does it. And I followed, I came to the conclusion that if you look at my value of death, it's the how the soil uh, makes like the, 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 the you have the bottom up movement of change makers underneath the soil and on top of it is the systemic world. And the first stage of my process aligns with, OK, you have all these different elements in our soils. They all have their different qualities, but they do what they do. And the second stage is, OK, if what connects all these different elements in our soil? It's the mycelium, the networks. And it is the same process that I followed in, okay, who is there? Um, otherwise, what kind of competences or activities or qualities or needs does that element have to, to, to flourish? How are they connected? Network analysis. And third is, okay, how can I make them co-create by bringing situationally together as a challenge room the elements in the soil, so we can start fixing things in the above world, in the systemic world, above the soil. And it really opened up my eyes. Said, okay, the only way that we can do this, if we organize ourselves as Mother Nature does. So how can we organize ourselves as a plant? And it, it, took, it took a lot of time to figure this one out, but Okay, the first stage is, okay, we need to analyze, we need to work and, and organize. Um, the second stage is, okay, we need to direct and connect. And, and, and the third stage, okay, how can we orchestrate collaboration and abundancy? Because Mother Nature doesn't organize, it orchestrates, it creates symphony. It's about abundance, about fair, it's about connection. And how does this resonate with the model that we have? And... The interesting thing is that during all the things that we did with a, a large group of people, we saw that we had 80 or 90 percent within our bottom up networks already there. We already know what we must do or what we should do. Our government isn't listening and the market doesn't fix it for us. So how can we as a bottom up movement, as an ecosystem of change makers with all the values and inventory that we have, work together with the systemic world and offer them a way to engage with us instead of inviting them into our soil and pollute it. And we don't need 80% of them. We need only 20% to collaborate. And if the plants, the plant in the middle gets an 
response from the systemic world, there, there is a problem. The plant activates its root system, brings in all the elements through the mycelium, brings it on top of the, uh, the soil, and it creates products and fruits that make us healthy and self solve the problem. But now um, the interesting thing kicks in. I said, well, okay, how, how can I organize or how can we organize ourselves in a way that we are able to create a level playing field with everything we have, with the systemic players? Because if we bring our herd of people together and all our inventory, and we come together in a place that the plant organizes, we only need to have two things from the systemic world. That's one, it's like, like Mother Nature, give us some sunshine, give us attention, show it, we are here, we have the solution. So give it attention and second, give us some rain so we can grow. And that could be money. So it's an interesting perspective, having a technical design, having a roadmap, doing all these steps and then look at Mother Nature and say, oh, hey, it's all there. And we took it away into the next phase. We designed the structure of how the plant functions. Wait, yeah, that's this one. Um, the next slide is, is a video. The entire presentation will be shared with everybody. So you can listen to it back and there is a video as well that explains this model. Um, it's in Dutch with English subtitles. So if you want, you can later on watch the video. Um, what I did, you basically are looking at the plant from the top. So common source, our mutual source is like the, the stem of the plant. The elements, the functions that you see here are underneath the soil. Um, and I ident identified from our perspective, in this case, seven different functions. So common source is not an organization. It's not a foundation. It's an open space where the gamification rules are being applied. Basically, you're looking at level three process where we as communities co-create, bring value together. What kind of functions does the plant need to flourish and co-create? A, it's the networks. We have ecosystem restoration communities, short food supply chain networks, uh, energy corporations. There are so many bottom-up movements there. We have networks. The second is we need IT technology, blockchain technology, transaction platform. We need to secure our data. So we can prove from our networks and farmer networks that we have value instead for instance if you look at the bionutrient meter what if we could activate all our networks give them a bionutrient meter maybe in the end it will be applicable on the, on the iphone and we connect it to this mutual data source that is not owned by nobody because it's managed by common source it's an open space of game rules and we collectively uh, organize our marketplace in a way where we make ends meet between our farmers and our city inhabitants. And whenever there is a problem there, we have the networks, the data, and the rollout process. In this case, our marketplace. We need another function that is the writing office. So what we did, whenever there is a problem with our farmer networks and the marketplace, and we have data, we look at, okay, what kind of problem is this? We need to analyze the problem. We need to figure out, okay, what is needed to, to fix this problem? And we need to get some funding. So the writing office has a function of identifying the obstruction, analyzing it, write a proposal, and then put it into the plant and figure out, okay, what kind of financial resources can we activate? Is it a city subsidy? Is it a, a European subsidy? Is it funding from our consumers? Can we pay it with the transactions? in our short food supply chain network, yes or no. Or maybe we can find some investments from other NGOs to fix this problem and develop it. But most of these projects, and that's an issue as well, they just give funding for the first stage, for the startup. And that sucks. Why don't the, our governments invest in collectives that, that combine elements instead of only funding um, level one? And if you're lucky, level two but then almost never invest in level three. And the reason why is they want to have 
the, the, the model of winner takes all in the marketplace to pick things that they want instead of we helping them to bridge into this new model. So we need to fix this one ourselves. So what you will see that is that will be a lot of projects and especially with, with our farmer community in the Netherlands, a lot of them develop solutions with a subsidy and after the project is being done, the, the, the result of the project is well not fit, the market is not fit for purpose to adapt it and our government is not able to make it a standard in the market with legal framing because, well, um, it's just not their role and task. So how can we make sure that all these values that are being subsidized are being integrated in a market model that we need? And the, 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 the second, the next uh, function after running the project is the playbook design office. And here's something interesting happens. So you have, for instance, in the metropolitan region of Amsterdam, we identified hundreds of, they call it, rural development program subsidies, all these small initiatives and experiments. If you get them into a playbook um, uh, office and they just look at and combine these different models and they develop it in a way that it can be shared and integrated in the marketplace in a way that it's scalable and replicable, then it becomes really smart. So we have our networks, we have our IT, we have our marketplace. Shit, there's an obstruction. The writing office this has a pro uh, identifies a problem, initiates a project. There's an MVP or a proof of concept, yeah, hopefully. And then the playbook office makes sure that it becomes scalable and fully integrated in the data process of the networks, the IT, and the marketplace. And then you can share it. Here, the co-creation platform is the second, the next step gives other regions, for instance, if I in Amsterdam develop a solution with Copenhagen and with a network in the United States or in South America, we can put it in the co-creation platform and we can offer it to other regions because every region can start this plant. It's not one plant for all. No, it's a thousand plants that follow the same structure and the game rules to speed up. And then last but not least, you have living labs. At this moment, if I look at all over the world, funds are being uh, invested and, and given to, to the creation of living labs. And how can we use these living labs where people and networks come together? How can we empower and speed up or maybe use it as a, as a space where real human connection is being established? How can we empower and enrich that and let the living lab become part of this network of plants? And this process from networks, data, rollout processes, writing office, playbooks, sharing, living labs, is like an agile process of working together. Now, an interesting thing is, how do I enter this process? How can I do that? Every function, every functionality has like these four steps. Inspiration, okay, I am here. Second stage, Activation is, okay, what do you offer? What are your needs and what is your expertise? And how are you connected with the others? That's an analysis. Then there is a standstill moment between the activation and conversion phase where you really step into this new game. That's the conversion phase. So every function has one, two, three, four steps to engage. We call these playbooks. So every journey if it's a network, it's a technological solution. If it's a market player, it's a knowledge institution. It's a, it's a designer. It's a, it's, a, it's a place where you can share. There's so many platforms that share. If Even if it's a consortium with a living lab, they follow the same four steps before they enter this place of trust and value. So common source is a way to create a network of plants that function in the same way, apply the same rules, but stay within their own context. And there's no one brand, it's a thousand brands that can flourish by following this process. And I think that's the beauty of it. We need to create a network of networks for networks. And if we want to connect, in this case, based on this model, other farmers, we just connect our farmer network at level three, like the big function with another network 
in other places. So here technology like blockchain technology kicks in. Um, this video explains it in Dutch with uh, English subtitles. So if you want to look at it, please do. The presentation will be shared and put online. Um, one of the key elements that we have, and I think with meeting Dan Kittridge, um, but also meeting other really knowledgeable people um, during our vital food meeting, like the meeting at the farm where we had all these quantum agriculture uh, experts there that have so much deep knowledge on the true value of food, the true value of nature and how it functions. We, within our company, engage with, well, in this case, more than a thousand students in our 18 years of existence that were inspired by our farmers, by our local uh, activities, the events that we did that they wanted to get into action. So the first stage they were inspired about what we what we did and what farmers do. And my colleague Martin, he is in the in the audience as well. He 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 really puts it nicely. I said at the university, I learned that we are in deep trouble. But at the university, I learned to analyze. But they don't offer me solutions. And there are so many really highly motivated young talents that there is not a question if we have more than enough farmers for the future, we don't offer them the perspective to act. So what happened is after a couple of years, we had about 50 students that didn't leave our company. So we have a company of 10 people working there permanently, but we had a 50 of them around our, our, our uh, office that, that stayed, they didn't leave after becoming inspired and, and really got their, their hands dirty and work with farmers and seeing and observing, okay, we learn at the university that we are basically in the shit, but if I listen to this farmer and I act, all the solutions are there. We can counter climate change. We can fix our, our, our health. We can fix our local economies. There are so many values and coming together that when they ins get inspired, they don't leave. They want to get into action. And for us, as a middle company, like short food supply chain and doing advisory work for municipalities, <laughs> it was a big challenge because we were really, really enthusiastic and happy with students willing to help us and act, but we didn't, we couldn't offer them a proper job. We couldn't offer them the perspective to really get funding to, to develop their vision or to onboard. So for us, it was epic. Um, and it's a big compliment, but it was also frustrating not having a solution for them to really come engaged. So Martin, my colleague. Mark, let me just interrupt for one second. Mark, yeah. uh, there, you got seven minutes left for your hour. And you've covered a lot of the, a lot of the bases, but with only a couple minutes left. So How many minutes? Seven minutes till the hour is complete. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, okay just to... um, I'm always done, almost done. Yeah. Um, so what you see is these universities, they teach them how, well, as he says, Martin says, how fucked we are. Um, but farmers offer them the opportunity to really take action and do something meaningful. So this is what we learned. And we developed also in this case, a customer journey for young talents. The first stage, again, is being inspired, just get into action. The second stage is, okay, you wanna get into action, you wanna do something yourself. We have a matchmaking structure there where talents get active and uh, start engaging with local farmers. So we did hundreds of projects with them together. And then after having this first engagement with farmers, they, if they don't want to leave, we train them to really become a transition ambassador. So they learn about food transition, they learn about their networks, they learn about technology, and they really know the barriers and obstructions in transition. So they, they can be active in our network of common source. So what you basically see, okay, you're inspired, phase one, you wanna get active, just do phase two. And if you really want to convert into the common source, we need to train you. And then second, execute. So you can be a, an entrepreneur, or you can be an advisor in one of our ecosystems. And there is a constant feedback loop in this process. Well, 
how does this all come together? I, I told you in the in the um, presentation that we have you for advice. So the European Commission, there is a lot of things going on in our politics, but we have some enlightened people in the European Commission that have funding to organize and orchestrate um, networks together. So they saw that there is a bottom-up movement going on that they need to empower. We, AMT, and our partners have been granted a project called EO for Advice, and this Living Lab is able to implement um, the structure of gain from the metropole region of Amsterdam, develop a model there that can be implemented in other regions so we can experiment and develop a learning ecosystem of regions that empowers local communities and is able to peer-to-peer -peer exchange knowledge through technology. Um, this is a picture of a functional design of the customer journeys that I explained. So okay, being inspired, being activated, convert, and then execute into an open space of, of um, common source. This is a functional design, how experts, policymakers, communities are step-by-step -step with an automated process being engaged in our ecosystem and in the end, co-create and being incentivized in a way that they all can speed up. In this, we use blockchain technology, and not only blockchain technology from the crypto perspective, but at the first stage, being inspired, you can enter the network. The second stage is getting active. We have a matchmaking mechanism there that connects you to farmers and others. And the third stage is the co-creation sp space. It functions with smart contracts and tokens. So you can be rewarded for the things that you do, but you also can be appreciated for the things that you did in the past. Because co-creating with networks is not only about the perspective in the future, but it's about what you have on your plate to offer. It's what about you have to carry as a burden on your back and your expertise. So we need to build a new marketplace next to the current marketplace where we together distribute value based on the real human connection and apply this epic new technology that is the, the, the language of the young generation in our society. So to empower the young generation, we can use this technology to create a network of networks for networks. And my promise and my invitation, and this is the video that I shot in Dubai, uh, where I explain the true value of blockchain technology in the perspective of enriching our soil, pay our farmer to do it, get the food on the plate of consumers and measure the effect of them in their microbiome and on their health and getting all these facts between the ears of our policymakers and say, okay, we are taking action now. It's up to us to show you the direction where we need to go, but we need to combine forces in a way where we create abundancy for all. And I think the farmers are there, the local communities are taking action, the technology to harmonize it is there. And I think modern nature shows us the way to do it. And yeah, hopefully we um, can do this together. Um, and it's all here. So the quantum uh, is bringing people together in a way and speeding up. So we are here for the process of re regenerating ourselves and our soil. So, yeah, hopefully we can do it together. That's my invitation. So then, thank you, Mark. <clears throat> that was completely brilliant. Um, <laughs> completely brilliant. Um, I'd invite you to turn off your uh, your slides and then yep. the other panelists to turn their cameras and. Um, audio on. Uh, <clears throat> this is this is it's wonderful to have a, a nice. Oh, Taylor's here. Wonderful, great. Oh, we we lost. Um, uh, we lost. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So the reason that I have framed the conference I has I have so far, you know, to start the first week was sort of where are we? What have we done with the BFA and the framing of it all? Second week. Um, with Ken, I just wanted to get those points conveyed to anybody who's raising animals this year because I think that's a really very, very powerful piece of the puzzle. Um, 
But before going into any of the rest of it, I wanted to have you frame this conversation about um, game theory and strategy, because that's how I'd love to um, support the process of the nutrient density movement. Um, this whole, the theme of this conference is the state of nutrient density. Um, we'll be covering a bunch of things. We have covered some things, but I'd love to, I'd love to, by the end of it, by, by the end of August, have some pieces in place amongst our amazingly um, global attendees to begin to take some of these things forward. I just, I really, uh, when I met you and I really understood what you were doing, I was like, my God, this is such an important piece of the puzzle and the opportunity to really scale amazingly rapidly is at our fingertips. So um, I'll just say that. I think the, the opportunity here for the for the other attendees, the other panelists is to maybe offer a couple of comments um, for those who have not been on before. Um, that would be uh, Mark and Martin and Taylor. Um, give us a couple of minutes. Indeed, Mark, actually, you haven't been on either, I don't think. Um, maybe a minute or two about <clears throat> who you are in context. Um, um, but I'd love to have it be a back and forth, you know, what did you hear? What do you think? I'm not sure, Martin, do you want to go first just because you are the person who's been working with Mark for a number of years now and hosted me at that Grounded Festival last last year, which was quite a memorable <laughs> experience. Um, yeah, it was great to have you there. It was absolutely a lot of fun and good to see you again. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Martin, I'm, uh, the one who learned in all the fancy universities that we were through bad feelings and started working with local farmers, which became a very positive story. And I realized that transition is not only about what we're not allowed to do, but actually, what do we want? We want more delicious food, more beautiful landscape. And that is required local action. So I thought, how can we make this fun? And how can we include many different people? Because we'll need people from all walks of life to help us make ecosystems thrive. So I've been organizing sustainable festivals, setting up culture hubs, and working with Mark, especially to connect young, motivated people to work and research opportunities in this field. And what I think is really exciting that you know, so many initiatives, like many people here on the panel in the room showed it's possible to restore ecosystems, to make healthy, resilient food systems, and all these solutions possible. It's happening. And what gets me really excited about this gamification model, the social processes and the digital infrastructure behind it, is that it allows it to speed up and happen so much faster and allow for these journeys for people, but especially for young people to grow into this movement. And that could be as a genuine legitimate career path as it is right now, choosing for things that don't make you happy. So that's what gets me really excited about seeing these models. Brilliant. Um, Mark, uh, this is Mark Shepard. I think many people know who you are, but maybe just a minute or two. And then you've been thinking and working and engaging in this kind of stuff for, for a long time. And our today's the universe called you in to be here out of, you didn't know what, you didn't, didn't know why you reached out to me <laughs> a little while ago. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts considered, uh, you know, opinions and perspective on this. Wow. Um, <laughs> there, there's a lot in here. Um, uh, my name's Mark Shepard. I've been a ecosystem restoration person from a long time back. And my personal focus has been restoring ecosystems. Number one. Because no matter what happens in the rest of the world in economy, education, you know, this, that, and the other thing, if I'm restoring my local ecosystems, at least I'm doing something right. Well, that led me to uh, join a co-op that at the time uh, I was the 24th member of this little co-op uh, that now has over 2,400 members. It's a billion dollar business. It's the Organic Valley Co-op. Well, working within that network, we're signing up additional growers, trying to set up other regions led me more into some nonprofit work. Um, and uh, <laughs> fast forward 30 years, we've tried so many different things through the years, uh, collaborated with so many different uh, enterprises and entities. Um, Dan Kittredge knows in 2018, I gave an economics um, presentation at the Bionutrient Food Association um, gathering. One of your slides had all these circles with all these arrows and the circle with the arrows is made up of other circles and arrows. I showed that that I had done and what we've been working on back in 2018. So this is what I've been working on for, you know, 30 years now. And uh, as an ecologist, I bring to the whole thing a certain perspective. I agree, absolutely agree with you that, yes, we can look at this as a plant, 
Well, we also have to look at it as a plant community. We have to look at it as an ecosystem. Yeah. And some of the things that have happened in, in my career, I want to at least bring out there and put on the table and say, we have to watch out for certain things that occur within nature. One are called predators. We have to have in place an understanding that there are predators out there. Their goal and their purpose in life is to mess us up and to stop us, to kill us, and to use our resources and take Absolutely. it as part of them. Absolutely. Be aware of this. Yeah. The other one are parasites. They don't appear to be predators, but they get in there and they can just slowly take away your resources. We have to be aware that there are parasites. This is a part of the real economy of nature. There are also scavengers and thieves. They don't do anything for themselves. They just come in to take things from you. And it's not going to, they're not going to eat all of you like a predator would, but they'll take little bits here and there and here and there. And then mm. another one happens, it can happen entirely internally, is disease. All of these things are real parts of nature. And if we are going to design ourselves after nature, yeah. we have to design that into our systems. Yeah. Um, there were some names on the on the participants list that I saw that I have a feeling I've run, run into in, in Africa. Um, both East Africa and West Africa were, were doing similar things, starting with the local growers, uh, setting up ecological systems, pooling products, manufacturing products, et cetera. And I just want to do a, a little shout out to the folks within the Earn Network, the, or the Earth Allies Restoration Network. And Solid Agro, based out of um, out of Belgium, that's working in West Africa. Also, the uh, Jane Goodall Institute and the Ecosystem Restoration Communities Movement, um, all of which you know I'm working with, and we're doing exactly this kind of work. Watch out for predators, parasites, scavengers, thieves, and disease. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And other than that, you uh, you uh, <clears throat> are aligned with. What he what he presented because you already figured it out yourself because many of us absolutely ready. that that yeah. is that is I think my life mission and our life mission and another thing we have to accept as a reality is some point in time death yeah. may enter into this thing and it's time to just walk away from the carcass and try something yeah. else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's my two cents. <laughs> All yeah, right, I know, I know. Yeah. Um, and I would just say for those who are attendees and would like to have their questions um, answered, please post in the Q&A box. Um, we'll be starting that in about 20 minutes. But until then, let's keep going through the through the panelists. Taylor, you're the new owner of Acres USA, which is a extremely storied enterprise. Um, and as I understand it, you actually got there through Mark's um, relationship with Mark. So that's a important piece of this conversation, but you're, yeah. What, how does this, how does this uh, sit for you? What, what's, what, what comes up for you in this and in, in listening? Well, thanks for the invite, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. For a quick intro, I, I farm about 25 minutes away from Mark Shepard's farm. We're both in South, Southwest Wisconsin. I actually run cattle on Mark's uh, awesome 110 acre permaculture farm. So I get to see his farm 27 years ahead of mine. Um, we planted 2,500 trees that are similar to the trees planted on Mark's place this uh, uh, year, and we're working through it. So I'm, I'm no expert by any means, but I have experience in marketing uh, and business, and I'm excited by Mark's talk about mentioning gamification um, with these different systems. And, you know, it, it's one of the biggest marketing points that can be made and one of the bigger things that we need help with in this food industry is modern day marketing and getting our information and the markets spread throughout the world so it was a great presentation mark um appreciate your time and dan thanks for the invite and i'm excited to attend more of these in the future well cool. great uh adrian and erwin you guys have been on previously uh <laughs> people know you a little bit at this point, but yeah, let's get everybody get everybody to say something and let's go back and forth. <clears throat> okay, you want to me to introduce myself again, uh, Dan, or just ask well, a question a to Mark? Bit. People kind of know who you are, but yeah, just it's, okay, it's yeah, well, short, yeah. I'm a biodynamic grower from the north of uh, Holland, and I grow a lot of uh, vegetable seeds. And um, my question to Mark is: uh, 
thanks a lot for your presentation and uh, mm -hmm. thanks for the good work in uh, connecting us as farmers uh, more directly to the consumers with all these systems modeling. And um, I have a question, what is your experience with this quantum agriculture that you tipped on about? Um, it opened my eyes that, that there are a lot of uh, things that have influence on us as humans that you don't see. And there is so much like bovis value, the, the, the energy of products, of soil, of humans is, is so important in healing them. I, I didn't know about that. I, I learned, I know nothing. I didn't know anything about frequencies and the importance of frequencies and that everybody, everything has a frequency that influences each other and yeah, it was completely new for me and understanding that there's so much more that we can't see that works with us empowers us um confirms with me that that um we are not alone yeah call it religion you can call it quantum fine with me but i just know and see and feel that there is so much more um and um what was shocking to me was the enormous amount of old people really spending their entire lifetime on this knowledge. And that is not in our universities, not in our schools and education. And it's not connected with young talents like Martin. So I'm, well, we, we need to make sure that these knowledgeable people have a, have a shield of young talents around them, getting this knowledge in challenging it and applying it so that that's yeah, that's what i saw and I, I know so i can trust uh, i have more trust in mother nature because of that and and i'm really practical i'm, I'm a game designer technology and 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 marketing but this one uh, i didn't say that one common really great cool do, do you know farmers or fields where this has been applied in, yeah in the Netherlands? Uh, yeah yeah, we, we started in the Netherlands because we built communities. We started the Vital Food Community, and it's about a 100 specialist on quantum agriculture, organic farming, the mater, all different kinds of uh, models. And they uh, share knowledge together and they build their own community based on this game model as well. So if you want, I can con bring you into contact with them and, well, just step into it and get all this rich knowledge. And maybe you can bring in some young talents from the university that are looking for a, for a meaningful life to help you with it. Cool. Yeah. I think quantum ag is an important, important topic. <clears throat> I think I saw one of the one of the points in the in the chat about what is quantum ag. Um, I would say it's a term that I've heard most through the acres community, and that's part of why I was so inspired um, when I went to acres was because they were integrating the the, the permaculture and the biodynamics and the um, organic and the soil food web and, and and conventional IPM with that sort of, when we say quantum, what do we mean? We mean consciousness, we mean intention, we mean life force, we mean God, we mean nature, we mean science, we mean, um, you know, indigenous wisdom, I think perhaps would be a way to frame it. Um, yeah. those, those knowings that you get directly, that force that is there that is actually what is life all of those things. And so um, it's a very important piece of the conversation. I think a lot of people acknowledge there's that as another <laughs> very important part of life that we don't necessarily cover in our <clears throat> in our Western rational, you know, mechanistic uh, framework. So although our framework can be used to express it quite elegantly. Um, yeah. So anyway. Thanks. Adrian, any, any any comments from, from you? Yeah, hi. Um, for everyone who doesn't know me, I'm a Swiss organic farmer and run a business in compost tea. And um, uh, it's a very small farm with some cows and cropping. But um, after my studies as an environmental engineer, um, we also had many students. Like each year, they, they started to have a community supported agriculture like little gardens where they sell the vegetables and in most of the cases it works but really on a low budget it's quite hard for them and often it's because of 
two reasons, and this is logistic and marketing. And I think the big stores are really specialized in this. <laughs> um, especially the marketing. I think each year the marketing budget going up of the big uh, food stores and how do you compete this and does the European Union pay so much money to <laughs> beat off this in the marketing or where is then the money coming from for for those small uh, scale farmers or uh, agriculturists yeah uh, I think it's it's a big question. Um, if you keep your initiative on a really connected and and low scale, yeah, you, you just run with your local community and and it functions. Eh? So what we did in the Netherlands, we have a concept here. It's called Hereboeren, and Hereboeren is like the optimum form of community supported agriculture. You have two hundred families. They invest two thousand euros. They have twenty hectares of land. They hire a farmer and say, just make the best food ever. And we will cover your back as soon as you have a loss or want to do an investment. But we want to have the best food ever for the best price, but you need to fix it for us. And then, then it works. But you look at, okay, can we compete with the supermarket? The answer is absolutely no. Not on a price level or on a volume level. It's not there. It's not in their language. It's not in their mechanics. They they are not able to to even connect, even if they wanted to. Um, from a legal perspective, from a marketing perspective, from a logistic perspective, it just doesn't fit. Maybe some greenwashing and put your products on a shelf for a couple of weeks, and then in the end you're at the bottom because the uh, <laughs> the algorithm says no, or the buyer says no when as soon as it starts to make some volume. Um, so no, you have to to create your own marketplace. Look at different archetypes of market models and make sure that you, as a farmer collective, have your networks in place and also organize your networks in the city. Just build a chain of trust and say, okay, we have a contract there. Can we do it together? Then I start growing your product. So in our journey, we developed a reverse marketplace that practically is, is, a, is a crowdfunding platform for crops and, and, and products based on residual streams. That, work, that works. So you get a payment in advance. You have your 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 subscriptions or your your advanced uh, uh, payments, and then you do it. So I know that 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 works. Um, but you need to look at the different models and focus not only on the sales of products, but on the human connection and their needs, and then just fill in the gaps and get paid for it. And yeah, it it functions every time. I want to. I want to be a, a, a bit of a uh, <clears throat> what's it called um, devil's advocate. So <clears throat> I would say that there are a lot of um, people who buy food from supermarkets, and if we're talking about rapid transformation of the supply chain, um, you know, getting farmers connected to land, etc., um, trained, producing at scale is is a significant uh, challenge in the short term, and I don't see any reason why. You know, some of us, I've sold tomatoes to Whole Foods in the past and gotten premiums for them. And I don't know why we couldn't necessarily be considering selling into supermarkets. I think the point about marketing and labeling and premiums and price identity and things like that, you know, <clears throat> just take a, a theoretical, which is that we're, you know, we're working with um, Ken Hamilton, who's figured out how to produce meat less expensively, but also more nutritiously. And he's, you know, there are a lot of farms that have, you know, that are raising chickens and 10,000 birds in a house or, 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 or whatever. Um, you know, I think the opportunity to take nutrient density and meters and science and, and labels and, and regionally coordinating to get into those large supply chains. I think we have Cisco as one of the big companies in this country that, you know, di distributes food around to hospitals and, you know, restaurants and and grocery stores and, and and all kinds of places like they could we could have lines in the cisco truck of quality and people paying for them as well i don't think it while well, i'm a small farmer and entirely in favor of all that stuff <clears throat> all the grain for the wheat for the bread in massachusetts is not going to be raised in massachusetts but being able to um discern that it was high quality and and pick your pick and choose accordingly would be would be valuable so 
Um, I, I would say, yes, 100% on the small local, but also um, large parts of the world have big pieces of land with that many people on them where food is being grown. And yes, long term, we want to be getting an opportunity for people to be reoccupying the land. But um, so, so that was a question exactly, but just a just a, a statement. <clears throat> and I'll kind of pop in between the both of you guys is uh, the organic valley part of me is we have 2,400 farmers. Yeah. Uh, and we all aggregate our product together. That's all going basically into the mainstream markets, including the big blue box in the USA, Walmart, mm -hmm. and how we individually make it work for us as farmers is we have to learn how to produce that product as inexpensively as, as, as possible. And mm -hmm. so that's what led me, of course, to do things in an ecosystem mimic and if you look at how an ecosystem operates, nobody pays anybody to do any, any soil preparation, pest control, disease control, tillage, none of that. That's all taken care of by natural processes. So if I design an ecosystem and manage my place like an ecosystem instead of a farm or an orchard, all of a sudden my expenses drop down to practically nothing. Well, that also means that my individual yields, instead of having 100% maize or 100% tomatoes, I only have 10% maize or 10% tomatoes because there's not enough room in a complex ecosystem like that for that much crop. And yeah. I'm going to get lower yields because of competitive effects. So where is that balance in the middle? That's where we as, as farmers and permaculture designers come into play is we have to figure out how can I design a system that gets me enough of the efficiencies of scale so I can actually sell competitively into the mass market. Well, then also I've developed this system that has all these little niche products that now I can direct to consumer in the small market short supply chain. So I can do both worlds. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. We, the dialectic has been solved. <laughs> yeah. um, Dietmar is on, and Dietmar is German. <clears throat> I don't, he's, his English isn't great. Um, he will be presenting um, because of the massive value he has later in this in this presentation. I think the plan is that Erwin would translate for him. I'm not sure how much Dietmar you've been able to get of the presentation, or if you have any comments. But I'd love to welcome your you to to share and to ask questions. And if you want to say it in German, and have Erwin translate. Um, that's yeah, <clears throat> practice for a future session. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to? I'm not sure if he. How much of that he he, he sent me a text that his internet is really bad where he is. Oh. He's near the Czechian border, so okay. I don't know. If... Okay, well, people can get to see his face at least, but um, <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. I think well, there, there's an interesting reflection on. What kind of products do we as communities sell? Is it only a product or is it data? Is it sharing value models? Is it expertise? So a lot of um, marketplaces only look at the sales of products to our, all the values that we create and we can create are not in the marketplace, but we can organize them as well. So if you look at data sovereignty, um, we are working on a structure with local fishermen, wild catch fishermen, that their vessel and what they do, I see. I see these these fishermen as the the only indigenous tribe of the Netherlands because they have like for seventh generation uh, roamed the oceans and and caught fish. Um, but applying data on their vessel and having this network of ships all around offers a, a new business model as well, where John Deere now hijacks and steals our data and use it to understand where the crops will be perfect and we're not so they can buy and sell where eh, they can divide the marketplace i think that one is is a, is a key business model that we collectively could organize uh, but, but one of the key values that we're trying to create is the value of culture and community and love and harmony and multi-generational you know healing right i mean all the business models are there you know, because of the logistics of living life. But as far as I'm concerned, the essence of this is is to be healed in a much deeper way, spiritually, culturally, et cetera, which That's I don't true. think with just want to emphasize. Yeah. All right. We have five more minutes in this in this straight panel conversation. Does anybody want to say anything to anybody else? Doesn't have to be to Mark or just any other comments? Uh, maybe to the other panelists. 
Do you guys also feel this wave of young people that are just knocking the door and saying, I want to join this movement. I want to get involved. Yeah. I feel that. I feel that with our, I mean, that's one of the biggest things that we're talking about inside of Acres right now is how do we connect with the next generation selfishly? You know, I consider myself the next generation. Um, <laughs> so I'm trying to, you know, our biggest thing we're doing with Acres right now is how do we take the information that we've gathered over 50 years and package it in a way that the next generation wants to consume it. Um, and I do think, I, th I think our my generation, which is, I'm 30, so I was born in 93. Um, I think that if I think of people my age, they're very cynical of, of food and they're, they question a lot, a lot of things. Um, and, and I think a lot of people know uh, what the current status quo is, is not correct. Um, they just need to be given the information and directed to where they can buy things and, and have the avail availability with their budgets. You know, that's the biggest thing. But the want that's is there. Fantastic, you know, because that's what it feels like. That's the local context. So there you're showing on your little island that it's that it's possible. That's where you can enjoy the good food, experience community in the tree. And that's a physical place where people onboard into this new system. And that's also how we see it. You know, these are all entry gates that can integrate human potential. And like Mark explained, onboard in almost this mycelial network <clears throat> to from there find their own way. Like, hey. I join the movement and it doesn't matter after watching a lecture like this, get into the system, go to local communities and from there deepen in something that often now we do manually, right? Have you checked out going an internship there? Have you met that farmer? Go get to work. But how cool would it be if you kind of join this no name I network and you start to build your own profile in that saying, I've done this work, I've done these experiences, a soil food web uh, course, I've done a permaculture design, I've worked at farms, get ratings and that allows you to grow. And from there, get me to match to further work opportunities or say, I've now earned my stripes. Look, that's my own profile as a sovereign person cruising through this network. And maybe with that, you can easier access some startup funds to set up your own farm or community somewhere else. So I think just by showing these examples, these journeys, that it makes it just a re legitimate option for so many more people to dive into these networks. And what I find very interesting as well, so just to come back to the bionutrient meat in this whole story, if we're able to, from these inspiring examples, build trusted regional networks and shape the real human connection and have elements to get the fact-based evidence on the table, then we can new, make new agreements and value models based on that. So for example, we would have never been able to do it by ourselves, but with our grounded community, we have about 500 young people together with the local farmers from local to local, we started a kitchen, on the science park. And it used to be a canteen where people buy money, they put their car through it and the money flip, flies away to shareholders of this big canteen catering organization. We say, no, can we collectively take ownership of that? Take the produce directly from the soil to the belly and could the increase in the health function and nutrient density be an indicator how we want to redistribute that profit made through that chain. So you can make these new value chains. And I think the buy nutrient is just a brilliant indicator to use in these new models because more nutrient density tells us so much about the healthier, the more diverse the soil and all the positive effects that come with that. Any other parting comments or we can move on to the, to the Q and A with the audience. <clears throat> all right. Um, I'll start reading out questions here. Uh, anybody who wants to speak to one, feel free. Um, let me see. Um, uh, Doug Bradley, uh, question for Mark Fredericks. Are there organizations in the U.S. that have embraced and activated the sort of model you described? If so, what and where are they? Um, I think um, we, are, we are discussing, uh, you know, one, what my observation is that a lot of networks that are active in this field develop similar structures. They just use different words for it so um, it's not the same but they follow the same nature-based principles so you see a lot of these transition models being applied and in the end if you look at them they they have so much similarity um, because they're also based on how nature organizes abundancy so the answer is yes do i know where they are um, no i don't have a list 
but there are a lot of networks connected to us that have the same vision and and we saw that that there are particles all over now um there's not a repository but we we can organize it if we want but i'm not sure of anybody who's actually laying out this model like you are mark that's why i had you on is because <clears throat> of all the people I know in the U US that are doing really wonderful pieces of this level one, level two, level three thing, I've never come across anybody's, you know, explication of it as as clear and specific as yours. I think we had Reginaldo um has the Marroquin on in the 2021 conference. And this was a big part of his presentation was this vision about how it should work and the concept concept of it bubbling up in circles within circles. And I mean, there was a whole presentation we did about that with Reginaldo, um, um, where I think that was he didn't he was speaking to it from a from a, a life of growing up as an indigenous man in, in Guatemala um, and really trying to convey, you know, that that mindset as opposed to the colonized mindset that a lot of us have been trained with. And and I think laid that out but um i mean mark was just talking about the the you know uh, organic valley as a co-op as an example but there's many many networks in the us i would say doing that but this for me the exciting part here is just this the the, the cogent game theory framing i think is is um unique from what i've been able to ex experience yeah yeah i didn't see anyone yet that that not only addresses the levels because i think that that that's not unique um but the transfer between levels and having the design using a playbook, like a functional design for these steps and how you can put in incentives in each layer, that's that's new. I, I, I didn't see that as a complete uh, model yet, but yeah, it probably is because I, I saw that Mother Nature does the same. So. Uh, but from a functional design, I think it's it's pretty unique. Yeah, it's probably the way our cultures were organized three hundred years ago or five hundred years ago in many parts of the world. It's probably yeah. it's probably nothing new under the sun. It's just uh... a <laughs> <Yeah. coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> Going back to the uh, yeah <clears throat> more living systems model. Uh, okay, Amelia asks, um, "Hi, Dan. Who is Ken Hamilton? You mentioned he produces meat economically with a focus on nutrient density. That was last week's presenter." Amelia, um, Ken Hamilton. So you should have the recording. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free to feel free to dig back into that. But if his name didn't stick, that's that's who that's who that was. Okay. Um Riza, Rizende, super interesting, Mark. Thanks for sharing. If I understand correctly, you were using this framework to connect farmers to the city of Amsterdam and giving them the tools to sell their produce to supermarkets, shops, direct selling, question mark. I wonder if this roadmap could also be used to redesign the food distribution to hospitals, schools, for example. I mean, you already have been doing that. And I think that's a piece you actually didn't cover. Was was so tell us about and doctors and how you're working with doctors. I mean, you really have a that is a big no, piece we, of we, 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 we within our platform with local to local and our network of short food supply chains, we focused on six different archetypes of local food systems. And one of them is business to business. And we focus on three markets, um, governments, education, and healthcare. Um, so and education is universities, uh, municipality of Amsterdam, and in this case, the central hospital of Amsterdam. And within this, we also, so yes, we distributed local food, we collaborated with caterers, we came into the, the dark world of public procurement, and all the the bullshit that they're selling there, um, and I think we 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 nailed it because we created a network of universities and partnerships and and the municipality and and healthcare institutions in our network in Amsterdam. So we created a, a force um, that says, okay, we want to have local food and we want to understand where it comes from and what is it. So that's a process going on, and in this that makes makes it really unique. We also applied a roadmap like a, a journey in that so what we did is the first stage is also an inspiration phase we sell local products through the caterer to the restaurant for instance for the municipality of amsterdam that's the inspiration phase we don't get a really big uh, paycheck 
or a large margin in that transaction, but it offers us access to the people working there. So the first stage is having a product in there with a sign of the farmer and a map and a QR code. Oop, you can get in. And the second step is after that the business is, is, is starting to pick up at the restaurant. We have like tasteries with a farmer in the restaurant and we give them uh, the opportunity to fill in a survey. So we ask the people working there two questions. What do you want from your food system? And second, what can you contribute to your food system? And here's something interesting happens. We came to the conclusion in this engagement that 11% of the people working at a university or the city of Amsterdam was willing to pay or invest his own money in the transition of a farm. Hey, wait a second. So they don't really buy my food, but they're able to invest. The reason that we have so many students around our company was because they said, we want to be a volunteer in your system. So first stage, selling local food, being there visual with local to local. Second, have a survey, ask the people eating it. Okay, I'm a farmer. How can you help me and how can I help you? And then the third step is having this information, convert them in the third stage to become an employee or an investor or buy the next uh, crop that is coming on or invest in uh, what well, we have designed. We have our own whiskey, our own vodka, our own pride juice, like lemonade from leftover vegetables. So you can co-create with them based on the data. And the interesting thing, I think that's important to tell. So we inspire them in the restaurant, we activate them based on data, and we convert them to like an investor or a real partner. And the, the real thing that happened based on that, when the caterer is being kicked out, our products stay because they paid for it. It's their product. And so we gamify that as well. So everything we do is based on inspire, activate, convert, and then execute. We don't leave. And yeah, there are so many examples in how you can organize your market and engage more deeply. Instead of selling more, you engage deeper. And you did that in hospitals and schools in yep. Amsterdam. And that's yeah. that's a really important piece of this puzzle is yeah. you know, I mean that's because those are so many people who want to get better food into their school systems um yeah. certainly universities but hospitals as well really looking for it and not beginning to understand the economic implications did you I mean how deeply did you go into the cost savings I think that was part of what you did with doctors was it not or maybe I'm misremembering about um how healthy people were and their and their improved and now, just what, what happened, um, because we went to the, one of the, in the early stage, we went to the Central uh, Academic Hospital in Utrecht, and it was about 10 years ago, and there was a doctor coming in like a happy kid, said, well, I can now, it's it's formal, I can tell people that honey is a medicine for mankind, yes, I don't go to jail, yay, Geronimo, and it was like, what the hell, um, okay, um, uh, great, and then what started is like this community of doctors, they engage with our farmers. And until that moment, we are still working with doctors and students following the education of medicine instead of health. We call it a medicine. It's called medicinal education instead of health. Um, we engage with these talents, these young doctors um, in the early stage of their education and in before just before they become a professional so we we infect them as well we, we po pollinate them with this story of healthy food so the movement like it like it's like a trojan horse that you build with you really engage with farmers and these young people because yeah, it's, it's really shitty to tell but if you become a doctor in the netherlands in an education of eight years you have two pages of text about food as a medicine two pages in That's eight so years yeah it's like <laughs> so we have a course within our network of students that they develop themselves in 10 years it's it's outside their curriculum but it's now becoming a formal part of the curriculum of doctors just because of this community growing and it, it, it's happening all over the world so it's not unique but yeah engaging with these communities is important brilliant I'm sure Bryce will be happy to hear about that and probably follow up with you later um, yeah. across, across Europe. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right. So uh, John 
A very good presentation and requesting Mark to comment on the equitable distribution of benefits along the value chain. This in line with avoiding the winner takes all common in most value chains, the producers are at least compensated for their work. I think that was uh, asked quite early in the presentation and you covered it, I would say pretty well. Any um, <clears throat> small things you wanna say about equitability um, of, of return? Uh, you pretty much covered it. Um, the equitability, you mean, how can I prove that there is added value in the market? No, no, no. I think the question just wanted to make sure that it was not winner takes all. And it looks oh. like we just came in early. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to say that's done unless something comes to you. Um, uh, Yesman, I missed the first six minutes of the talk, so apologies if this was already mentioned. Farmers you worked with in the Amsterdam case, were they a mixture of conventional and organic slash biodynamic farmers who also valued supporting nature? The awareness of sustainable ag is highly developed, but in other countries, I wonder if there would be enough similar small-scale farms with common interests of sustainability, organic, et cetera, to come together. Will this model require a certain amount of, or minimum local regional participants? Um, the first question is, um, do we only focus on small-scale farms and do we have enough? No, we don't judge if you're organic or not. We just ask you to be open and transparent and have an ambition to become more inclusive and uh, regenerative in the end. Um, so we have traditional farmers and we have like the other end, small scaled, organic, regenerative farmers. Those are both of value, but we are fully transparent on what these farmers offer our community. And one of the biggest examples of the value that we were able to create with our short food supply chain was at the beginning of local to local. We had two fruit farmers. One is called Yako. And Yako was a traditional farmer and from a really an old, multi more generation farming family, large scaled pears and apples monoculture. And we had William, an organic farmer, just started 15 years ago, 17 hectares of, of, of fruits, organic. And with the spark, uh, William told me, well, that's Yako. He's a polluter. He kills nature and he makes people sick. Okay. And Yako said to me, that's William. He's a hippie. He only smokes weed and he, he pollutes as well. So we are, well, whatever. But what happened by connecting them in a collaboration in the short food supply chain, they became friends. Yeah. And when the shit hit the van and the apple price for three years in a row, and the father of this other, uh, the, the Yako, got divorced from his Polish uh, uh, wife. He couldn't get his funds to help his son because they were blocked. And what happened is William helped uh, Yako to transform his farm into an organic farm. And he got a good price. And they both developed, and that's Martin's uh, thing that he did as well, an energy corporation where they planted solar panels on top of their fruit trees to get soil, to get uh, energy, to have their crops happening, to manage their water storage better. And they started an energy corporation and a buying corporation. So now Yako, 10 years later, is 100% organic. They have their energy corporation and they work together. So the best thing that happened was bringing them together and just build the bridge. Yeah. So don't judge, we need them all. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, as soon as you think you know better than somebody else, is a time when it's time the for you to question is how many do you need? <laughs> how many do you need? It's not yeah. about the quantity, it's about the willingness to collaborate and accept each other's value because there is a lot of, um, well, uh, both sides in, in farming, traditional and organic. But in the end, if you bring them together, they, they most of them speak the same language. We're all both in the pinhole to, to make this next step together. So, yeah. Maybe and, 10. Start and, with. If you're not part of a big enough ecosystem, you're still a level one. The part of the whole game gamification process is you're not in a place to do the level three yet because you haven't gotten there yet. If you don't, if you're not part of the network yet, then you're not, I mean, you're not at level three. That's part of what I really appreciate about what you're saying is like people can come in and be interested, but you can't start to really operate in these next levels until you've gone through the first couple levels and built yourself up and connected and established relationships. That was one of the first points you made at the beginning of the presentation. Yeah, After and 10 years of struggling and trying to figure it all out, I actually have a network now. So and, it's and, something that happens all the time. 
one really important observation was we had, that's a long time ago, we had a student called Wietse. And Wietse told me, well, um, probably all these farmers want to sell their products in the short food supply chain. I said, well, that's a good question. So what we did, we invited five farmers, similar age, and we just asked them the question, why are you active in the short food supply chain? And only one told me that they needed us for selling his product for a good price. The other one said, I have a story to tell. And I'm not hurt in my region. So I, I'm proud of what I do. So help me bring my story through the table. The other one said, well, I'm not able to, to really write all these proposals to get some subsidies. Can you help me with that? Another one said, I need workers. I can't find people to do the work for me. So can you help me get access to? Another one asked for knowledge. Yes, and one of them needed us to help him with selling his entire crops. That didn't happen. But if you look at the short food supply chain, the chain, it's not only a chain of selling products, it's a chain of trust, it's a chain of knowledge, it's a chain of data. So look at it, layer it up, all these values and chains. And that was, for me, was an eye-opener. Him tell, asking this question and we reflecting on it and we gave, <laughs> it was like, okay, there are more values here. Yeah. Great. Um, <clears throat> Yesim asks, uh, how can we read slash learn more about the details of this model applied for Amsterdam? The the, the slides are going to be available. Um, yeah. Recording. you got links that will, I'm guessing they're live links in those slides. So when... Yeah. People who are registered get the email following up with this recording. There'll be a link to the slides as well, which will have hyperlinks. Um, yeah. And the videos, videos, hyperlinks. And if you need some more, just reach out. Brilliant. Cool. All right. Um, Sue, thank you, Mark. Great presentation. I'm sure we can all see our own or parts of our own journeys in your framework, right? for me, certainly. Could you tell us a little about the biggest challenges you faced at the various levels and how you overcame these? Uh... Yeah, it's, it's a big question. Um, the, the complexity of each level is it that it is connected with the other level. And the complexity is not addressing the, the entire uh, level play. So the biggest challenge in the beginning was, was my business model selling local products and expecting on level one to get a good price and a large enough margin to, well, to develop my online platform, to 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 invest in logistics and do all these things. So the first challenge was, was just having getting the business going and not knowing, well, nothing about selling food or or whatever. And the second one, um, that's more on level two, is how do you organize uh, collaboration? So I, I I I set up a couple of corporations with farmers, and every time we got well, in trouble because it's not about organizing the farmers. It's 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 addressing all these different uh, expectations. So that was on level two, really challenging. How how do I organize my network of farmers? How I do I address their needs? And um, well, that was really really hard. It's 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 hard to to gain trust from farmers, and and make sure that you keep it. So um, that that was on the on the on on the second level. Um, and then you have your traditional business challenges and, and scaling up uh, and all the costs that come with it to deliver business to business, for instance, or have a business to consumer network uh, with all the food safety issues. Um, and on the third level of co-creation, really understand deeply how these different inventory, these different values like data, reach, expertise how you can monetize it in the process of co-creation we we made a couple of mistakes there not addressing um everybody's role in that process and be completely clear about okay listen you're going to enter this co-creative space you bring in your network you bring in some money you bring in some knowledge and in the end you will get this reward so that managing that expectation was really difficult and on on level four like the level of principle steering. Um, yeah, struggling with my gamification rule and now really narrowing it down. If we have a question, we have a lot of knowledgeable people that understand modern nature, how we could adjust the rules of the game based on the principles of modern nature. That was the challenge on level four. But maybe the most difficult one was, was struggling with having a traditional cooperation with farmers setting up that don't completely understand the entire game that they're in. That was really difficult. Great. 
Um, <clears throat> got another qu question from um, Sue slash comment to Dan. I've noticed that the conversation about regen farming in the US and Europe are seemingly led by men. Is this a right perception? And if so, what might be the reason? Um, I would say, Sue, that I've been feeling very self-conscious about the number of white men on this presentation uh, today, but also the previous two weeks. Um, yeah. There are a number of women who are presenters. Uh, one of them did sign on at the beginning and I was hoping she'd be part of the panel today. She wasn't. Um, um, all the panelists, all the presenters are invited to, to attend and those who choose to cho choose to, those who don't, don't. Um, but more broadly, if you want to look at the at the personalities, um, I would say that um, the majority of the speakers on the circuit, if we can call it that, are, are men. Um, your guess is as good as mine about you know the nature of colonization and patriarchy versus the nature of an essence of a woman and and what that is. I'm seeing Christine Jones, yeah, you know, Nicole Masters, there, you know, Elaine Ingham. There's definitely leaders in the space, but as far as as far as the 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 you know the, the majority of the personalities, it certainly is. It is that. Um, I can't say specifically, um, but yes, a good 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 question. And I I am very sensitive to the <laughs> gender balance uh, here right now. I would love it to be more more balanced. Um, yeah. Okay. Now we have uh, two questions: one from Ned, one from Henry, that are a bit overlapped. <clears throat> um, Henry asks. In the Netherlands, the bare supermarket shelves was a trigger for awareness and change. What are other triggers? Question mark six three, uh, which I presume he's referring to the mega six mega three ratio. Um, and then Ned asks a uh, question for both Mark and Dan: What is stopping us from using the mega three six ratio in food as a main selling point, and thereby selling medicines of calories? Um, and I would say, uh, you know, what's exciting based on where we're at with the beef project and some of the presenters you're about to see about where we're at with the beef project. And what we did discuss yesterday, last week with Ken is that it looks like we will be in a place to be able to potentially use that as a, as a claim that correlates to overall human health, soil health, animal welfare, farm viability, et cetera. And the opportunities around that are extremely significant, um, which, you know, there's, it's great to have opportunity, but then you have to actually implement it. So, if that were a topic for our wargaming, as it were, of how to use Mark's, you know, brilliant game theory to how to use nutrient density around around the market, I think that would be a great, great, great topic to do that. Um, and certainly, um, yeah, my my wheels are turning on the topic on the on the front, but I think those are that's a totally great call. Any any comment on your front, Mark? Yeah. Um, what is interesting, if you look at the networks of short food supply chains all over the world, so they're, your local to local isn't unique. There are thousands of these initiatives in Europe, maybe hundreds of thousands of this. I think in Amsterdam alone, there were 80 initiatives oh. figuring out the relation with farmers and, and empowering local communities. Um, and the interesting thing is, if you look at, okay, what are short food supply chains? It's a, it's a real human connection between a farmer and a consumer. So the one that makes it and the one that eats it. If you look at from it from a clinical perspective, I, I've been a publisher for a medical publisher, and you look at the process of accreditation for medicine, you need A-B testing, blind testing, and you need a sufficient amount of testing that proves the, the medicinal value of a, of, a, of a pill or powder or whatever. And these networks of short food supply chains between consumers and farmers you can do the same. So if I deliver local food from my short food supply chain to a healthcare institute or an elderly house, and okay, we're not able to test, but we can deliver a, a measured product on a higher nutrient density level than another. And I know one thing that these uh, uh, elderly houses measure like really precisely, that's the intake of medicine, because that is about money and about refunds. And, and about subsidies and, and insurance money. So they measure the, the amount of peeing pills, the downers and uppers, really precise. So if I can prove that I am delivering this nutrient dense product to this department for six months and not to this department for six months, I can fact-based evidence prove that this had an effect on the consumption of pills. And if I do it in one institution there is well there's no evidence but if i simultaneously as an ecosystem 
do this in hundred times places all over the world and log the data, then you have clinical evidence. And I think the value of the density and the meter and the procedures and then having change of trust between farmers and consumers to test it is mind blowing. So we are able to, we know that we have the evidence there because we believe it and we feel it, it's just logic, but we can prove it. And we can also use it as a well, legal instrument, why not? So this can be a, a, a proposed project for our collaboration um, going forward. I, I would have yeah, a natural, natural fit for where we stand right now. Um, yeah. I think it would be a great thing to be, you know, talking to everyone who's in attendance um, about ways they might be willing to engage in what, you know, crops they're producing and, and how we can be marketing and verifying and testing and things like that. I mean, use the use the community that we are now to to accomplish that if that's something of interest to people. Yeah. Uh, great. Fine with me. All right, we've got uh, three questions left and and four minutes. So I'll just read them quickly here. Um, Riza uh, says, sometimes it can be hard for an NGO to have all the capabilities within this team, fundraising, proposal writing, networking, et cetera. Do you know of any EU support for NGOs in this sense? Maybe that question also came in before you spoke to what you're doing, because I think um, there was one other question Riza asked that I think she would probably want to be talking to you about maybe since, um, well, Talk to so we a writing yes. office in the in the in the common source structure. There is a writing office, and you have and that already in place. Facilitates yeah. the process of writing proposals from the the collective, like the level three partners. They work with uh, the writing office. Yeah, so I can can if you looked at the presentation and the video in my presentation where I stand with for the screen of uh, the school board, <laughs> um, with with the. Uh, I explained it there. And if you want to learn more, reach reach out and I will uh, give you some more information and templates that you need. Or you can Good. join uh, our writing office as well. Yeah. Great. Um, Doug asks um, or says, thank you. I found the analogy of the plant world with a myriad of different organisms that are interconnected quite compelling. I also think it is unique to what I have seen where most organizations are very compartmentalized. So maybe that was just a affirming that any quick response to his statement or just let it sit there thank you yeah <laughs> thank you yeah all right help me challenge it because it needs improvement and we need to yeah. start using it to optimize it and, and get rid of the parasites predators thieves thieves and understand how we <laughs> can challenge disease because that that stick to me like okay uh, can we apply our gamification to to identify this and then figure out how we could, well, isolate and then kick it out. Yeah. Um, uh, Marios, you talk about healthy food. How can we make the difference between organic food, healthy food that is used, even nutrient levels are low? I'm not quite sure if I understand that, but maybe that's part of what um, Megan will be talking about at her presentation. Okay, uh, last question here, uh, or Sue, just a comment. We had a BRICS reading of um, regen pigeon peas in Kenya of 25.5. Sadly, many of our indigenous crops that are nutrient dense as orphan crops. We plan to use BRICS to change this narrative. Brilliant, Sue. Absolutely. Those traditional indigenous, what nature plants is actually what she thinks is best to grow there. And what humans have been working with for a long time is probably a good thing to be doing as well. So, yeah, um, yeah 100%. <laughs> Great. Um, any 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 final final comments, Mark? This has been a wonderful presentation. Um, I thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, I would love to um, to further develop the bionutrient meter as a an instrument of mass creation. Mm -hmm. So let's figure out how we can engage communities through the meter and connect to farmers and get the value in the pocket of the farmer, on the plate of the consumers, and between the ears of the policy makers. And I think we can. Yeah. I'm really privileged of presenting this and you reaching out to me, Dan. So thank you very much. Deep, deep respect. And I'll only I'll only say one thing, uh, co-creation, a weapon of mass co-creation. I think you've... you've yeah. <laughs> I, I always say weapon, eh, because that's my narrative or my game. Of no, no, no. You, it's from weapon to mass destruction, but yeah, I'm just taking yeah. it to the next. Yeah.
a mass a weapon of mass creation, co-creation. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, Mark. Let's pull the system instead of fight the system. Eh? That's better. We're all actually humans, who most of us have families and and, yeah. and and communities and culture and mean well. And this whole us them paradigm is part of the fraudulent paradigm. I know what Mark was saying is yes, there are there are pathogens out there, but I think if we can identify as almost all humans are are deeply aligned and see that light of God in them, if we can say it that way, um, I think we can go very fast, very far forward. So, great. All right. Thank you I all. I see a lot of links going on in the chat that, that give us some insights and tips. So, I'm yeah. uh, looking That's forward to that. Recording copy well. them. So, if you can, we can share them and, and look at them and figure out how can we use this knowledge that's being offered. Uh, it's all part of the recording. So, anybody who's part of the event gets the recording and all, everything you put in the, in the chat, everyone has access to later. So, yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. Thanks lots for organizing them. Yeah.